I grew up in an artist family. My father was a fine artist, he painted pictures. So I was always interested in art and tried my hand at it, but I found out I didn't have a natural gift for painting. And I saw my older sister working on calligraphy, and so I tried it too, and it seemed to go real well. And so I developed the, uh, the interest in it all by myself. And I grew up during the Second World War, and after the war was over, we heard from my aunt, my father's sister, in Chicago, and she offered to have the oldest two children come to America. And then my father said, you can't just go to America and learn a little, know a little bit of English and know a little math. You need to have a craft. So what do you want to do? And I said, I'd like to take up calligraphy. So even though I was actually too young for art school, it was for people who had graduated from, art, from high school, they took me because the immigration was eminent. I had no idea how long it would take. We applied when I was 16, and by the time I came to the shores of America, I had just turned 19. But in the meantime, I had a wonderful experience of being in art school in Germany. I had a great teacher who was a pupil or a so-called master student of Rudolf Koch. He invented a whole lot of typefaces. He was a very good type designer and had these master students in Offenbach, Germany, of that school. And his name was Friedrich Heinrichsen. He is well known among calligraphers and just a very talented man. And from him I learned a lot. And he was wonderful in providing things to do for money for his students. They would have contests and we could all participate and the winner would have an income. And he had designed uh, something for the Chamber of Commerce and he turned over the lettering of the names to me. This is called Master Letter. So all those craftsmen who became masters would have their names inscribed here and then the date put down here in Hanover. This all took place in Hanover. It was my first big job and it increased and increased and pretty soon I could hardly make my classes because I had so much work. So that was my first big job that continued until I left Hanover and came over to the United States. And there were other jobs, like lettering signs for stores. And one that I didn't appreciate was lettering the daily specials on a butcher shop. And all the passers-by would make comments as they passed the butcher shop early in the morning on their way to work. But I found out you can't be a prima donna, you have to do everything that comes your way if you want to be successful at this. And that was my goal. My father being a fine artist, we didn't have a regular income, and so I was determined to go the commercial way and uh, have my income from it. And that certainly worked out well. So usually he had us practice on very large sheets of paper. That was the normal mode. We had large drawing boards and we had to work very large because he said mistakes show up. I want to be able to see them and correct them large. But once in a while we had to do something very small and he wanted each one of us to do a little book. And so I chose this one here. It's done in an antique paper and I did it in the different styles I had learned. This being Gothic, also called Old English. The same style here, done in black. This is the Christmas story, by the way. And he helped us to lay out the initials because we were all new to this. And I had practiced the Roman caps in, with a very thin little croquel pen, and that's what I did here. And every capital letter I did in red to lend a little more interest to it still using very small nibs to go with the scale of this very small book. And there again, the teacher used this opportunity to show us how you leave room for a pretty capital letter for an initial. And you do the body copy first because it's taking a lot less time than to do the penciling and the drawing and the filling in of the paints in the capitals. 
So I had fun doing this and I thought this was pretty bold when I look at it now, many years later, how I divided the word Bethlehem. I wouldn't do it now, but when you're 16 years old or 17, you can get away with it. And there, this is the last page. This is one of the little art school projects. But I thought it was very interesting that my older sister, who had the same teacher, went to the same art school. Instead of getting started with certificates, which I did, she got started and had a regular income designing tombstones, beautiful tombstones. They were then handed over to a, a stone carver who inscribed the lettering that she had designed. And her other forte was doing posters for the theater. So those were her main sources of income. It was wonderful that we all you know, could make a living with this. So then I came to the United States and I, under my arms I had all these wonderful samples and I applied for work and was hired by a large art studio in Chicago. I was one of three calligraphers. They had high hopes of giving me lots of calligraphy to do. And occasionally, there actually was something, like here in 1951 was the year I came over, and this was one of the first projects I did for Bielefeld Studios, where I was working. But they didn't find nearly as much to do in calligraphy as they had hoped, because it was the age of brush lettering. In Germany, we were not doing brush lettering in the 40s, when I started going to art school. And when I came here in 1951, it was a total surprise to me because brush lettering is what was in. All the other lettering artists were doing it. And calligraphy was a very special field and not many people were doing it. So I had to learn brush lettering in order to earn my keep at the studio in Chicago. And I quickly had to change over to brush which I found very distressing in the beginning because a brush is very soft and wiggly. And when you have had a steel nib in your hands and a steel nib is hard and there is a real stiffness to it, and all of a sudden you have this little wiggly brush to move around, it took a while. Fortunately, there was one other lettering artist who helped me during his lunch hour and after about six months, or maybe a little less, I had it down and I could do it too. And this is one of my first brush lettering jobs there uh, that I did. And uh, otherwise, I was used for all, all kinds of lettering. We marvel at the price of $2.99. Another little ad over here where I had to use the brush for Slenderella goes to Paris. So women were preoccupied with being slender, even in the 50s. One of our main clients was the Chu Company here. There again, you know, wonderful price for nowadays. And you see again the brush lettering for $3.99. Then if I didn't do brush lettering, it was usually what I would call constructed uh, lettering. Like you would draw it out first, the outline of it, and then fill it in with black ink. Now for this particular ad, we can see the original lettering here. This is finished art, and then it was used like this in this ad. So that does not automatically flow out of your pen the way it is. It has to be constructed. I spent five years in Chicago working there in the art business. Then I came to San Diego and I was hired by Philips Ramsey Advertising Agency. And they used me mainly for inking in logos. Often they were designed by other people, but they didn't have the steady hand to do the inking or the final for the final product. So I was used a lot for that. So I have a few little examples here to show. These are logos that I did here in San Diego. 
There's this and some more like that. Autumn here, that happened to be a subdivision. I was so amazed to notice this interest in calligraphy. I thought, how did this ever happen? And all of a sudden, I noticed that even I was getting calls from students and from other colleges. And I feel a lot had to do with the Kennedys being in the White House and Jacqueline being very art conscious. She employed three calligraphers full time. She kept them busy lettering invitations, lettering the White House menus, doing envelopes and place cards and all the things that calligraphers do. And these things were publicized in some of the leading magazines. That's how I found out about it. And then a lot of colleges became interested in it because all of a sudden there was a demand. People started calling about classes. Then the colleges were looking for teachers. There weren't that many at the time. And a famous calligrapher came over from England. His name is Donald Jackson. He is the calligrapher to Her Majesty the Queen of England. He does wonderful work and he came to America to lecture. And he was interviewed by one of the major suppliers of art materials. And uh, the interviewer asked him, so Mr. Jackson, what kind of art supplies do you use? And out of one pocket he pulled a little stick of Japanese stick ink. And out of another pocket he pulled a quill and he cut his quill and he made his own ink and he started working. It was very impressive. Something I've never been able to do is cut a quill. But he was an expert and I know our teacher showed us in Hanover but it was just beyond me. So I resorted to the steel nibs and I'm using the same nibs to this very day. They seem to last forever. And then another phase of my work was doing lettering for brides. So I have a whole little album that I usually show when prospective brides come to have their envelopes lettered. And so I show them this. I show them some sample envelopes and then they pick something here from this. There. This is an ongoing job. Many calligraphers are kept busy with doing envelopes. Because even though computers do envelopes too, but they are just not as free-flowing and not as interesting. And those who care about craftsmanship, they still like to have it hand-lettered. Another phase of my calligraphic career has been doing greeting cards. And these are the latest little slogans that I have done for a company that is actually using them for computerized greeting cards. And they used other people to do the illustrations, like on this one, for instance, there were animal pictures involved with this. It would go with, uh, no one can outfox you, congratulations. So I imagine it was a picture of a fox. And uh, here's something, I go ape over you. Obviously a monkey was involved. And then there were some flower cards, you know, and then this kind of lettering would go with it. But it gave people the opportunity to choose whatever they wanted to have with their flower pictures or with their animal pictures. And within the package were the cards with matching envelopes, a selection of white and a selection of buff color, and then a whole lot of different possibilities of what to choose. They were invented by the Great Northwestern Greeting Seed Company, put these out. And they were very clever, like I would letter this, I love you. And then on the inside it says, a bunch. And then in here are carrot seeds and directions how to put the carrot seeds in the ground. Or here you see somebody, some illustrator did the flowers and then I lettered, you are the greatest mum in the world. And then again on the inside, how to plant your mum seeds, and I love you. 
And here again, flower seeds with thanks and lots of small lettering there. I could incorporate many different styles depending on the size. And as I see, the layout was always handed to me, like here, you know, larger. In fact, this was brush, which I rarely used for the greeting seed cards. All this was done, it was a little pen. But it was a great way to incorporate all kinds of styles. When I see a layout, I try to make the lettering fit the words, like a shower shouldn't be done in a formal old English or anything like that. It should go with the wording or bon voyage, you know. Now this is for a cow. Hope your new home is <laughs> a moving experience. <laughs> Flowers of the field, potpourri. This is more what I call a built-up letter. I had to do the outline and then it was left right in this case, you know. So this had to be done with a very thin pen or an outliner, just an outliner pen. You can't do this with one stroke if you have, if you need an outline letter. Later on they even came out with tea bags. You get directions how to steep your tea or a packet with cocoa, make a cup of hot cocoa, hot chocolate. So you see this went on and on for many years and just lots of fun to do all this. And we did it all through the mail. They would mail the layouts to me. I would do the finished art, mail it back to them and they handled it from there. So it was a great thing to do while I was at home raising two sons and I could do it all, you know, through the mail. Didn't have to go out of the house at all. Just an ideal thing. Another major phase of my career became teaching, which I had never intended to do and never thought of myself as a teacher and really didn't have any training for. But I had to become a pinch hitter for somebody who had planned to teach the class who had his lesson plan, who had my samples borrowed to show them to the first class. And at the very last minute, he had to have surgery for an old football injury. And so he called me and said, you have to step in for me. You have to teach this class. And so there I was teaching them the same methods that I had learned in Hanover, Germany, remembering my teacher and just lettering an alphabet on the blackboard. And I did a whole alphabet in one night, which I never did later on after I became more experienced than I knew. I had to divide up my alphabet and I started with simple letters like the I and the L and the M and the N. And then we would do the round group. And finally, I would introduce an A, which is a rather hard letter to do for somebody who is new to it. So after my first uh, session there, it became easy. There was a holiday weekend and I could work up my own samples. And then I knew what I was doing and I had more confidence. And I taught for at least 20 years through the different junior colleges and also at the University of San Diego. It was called Lettering for the Graphic Designer. And another course was called calligraphy for fun and profit. And they were indeed fun classes where I would teach something different every night, covering certificates and greeting cards and logos and you know, something new every night. So I always start in my classes with the Roman alphabet because these beautiful Roman letters were carved into the columns in Rome and those are the very same letters that we use nowadays. We can recognize them as a glance and so that's what, um, where I start. Yes, from the Roman, then the next style were the anchors. One can also pronounce this anciers. Most people call it anchors. It's an all capital alphabet, no upper and lower case. And then the Irish invented the half anchors, which is already upper and lower. 
and they did the beautiful Book of Kells, which is one of the finest works in calligraphy that still exists nowadays. One can still see it in Dublin, I believe it is. All the colors were natural dyes and are just as brilliant as they were when they were done. And pure gold was used for the decorations. So it's a magnificent piece. Then other styles, variations of that. And then finally, Germany excelled in the Gothic, the very tall, slender letters which was done during the same time when they built the tall, slender cathedrals like uh, Cologne, others like that. They are in many of the German cities. It seemed to just go with the German character. And people associate it with like a Christmas letter because it's like Christmas markets and so forth. They are always being advertised in that style. Yes, one more thing that is still keeping me busy even nowadays, something that the computer cannot do. And that is work that I get from the local framers. The uh, places here that frame pictures, many times they are photographs, and they like to have the person's name put under it, or when they won a race, a yacht race, or whatever it might be, the date and the name maybe of the yacht. And uh, so I do that and apparently no computer is able to print on these real thick mat boards. But we have to find our own little niche in the world and I believe I found it.